it's a pleasure to see. I've been tracking men and fathers um, coming to events involving children, and so it's a pleasure to see some men and dads here. Um, I will say that sometimes at events, I don't see men, and in general, I have been tracking this, and I just want to say that I have, uh, one of the things I'm very conscious of is that, you know, around 10 or 15 years ago, they started putting baby stations in men's rooms in public places. And in the last 10 or 15 years, I've never actually seen a man use one of those baby stations. <laughs> And a few weeks ago, I was at an airport, in the Boston airport, and I used the restroom, and I finally saw a man using the baby station. And I went up to him, and I got so excited, I went up to him, and I looked over his shoulder, and he had a laptop computer out of him. <laughs> but he might be like changing the diaper virtually or something. Anyway, I want to I wanna try and do um, a, a couple of things tonight, and I also want to really engage you if, if we have time in a conversation. The first thing I want to do is try and lift kids out of what I think is a mud of misconceptions about how they become good and caring people. I then want to talk about what, I, what are, the, in my mind, the real threats to kids' moral development. And I don't worry so much about it. I worry a little. I don't worry so much about media, about peers. I think the biggest threat to kids' moral development is our modern, in, in many communities, is our kids, is our modern intense focus on our kids' happiness and their achievement. The degree to which we have elevated happiness, self-esteem, achievement as the primary goals of child raising and demoted morality or caring for others. And finally, I want to talk about solutions, some of the things that we can do as parents primarily, but also some of the things we can do as educators. And let me just start with the first one. Um, and the, the issue of what we focus on when we focus on moral development. And I fuss about this because I think that when most of us, a lot of us think about moral development, we are thinking about the first one on the list, on moral literacy. That a public agenda survey says that about 60% of American adults think the biggest problem with kids today is they don't know right from wrong, they don't know fundamental values like caring, honesty, respect, fairness. We have a billion dollar character education industry out there, which is trying in schools, in sports fields, in youth programs, to hammer these, kid, these values into kids' heads. And I think there's this idea out there that the more we repeat these values, the more we chant about them, the more likely they are to stick. And I became concerned about this about 10 years ago when I was talking to my daughter and a couple of her friends, and I was giving them a question in a popular character education program. It's always a risk when you come to my house that you get, um, you have to answer a moral dilemma. But the dilemma from this program was, should you be honest with your teacher if you forget your homework? And these, are, these girls are six years old at the time, and one of them says to me, do you want me to tell you what you want to hear, or do you want me to tell you the truth? <laughs> and another says to me, I know that I'm supposed to say I would be honest, but nobody, no kid I know would be honest about that. And it got me thinking about this more and digging into some of the research. And, and the reality is that by the time kids are five or six years old, they basically know these values. They know that adults think that honesty, care, respect are important. And often, because they know these values, they feel patronized by these lectures about values, by these chanting about values, particularly teenagers. And what they're becoming adept at is learning how to parrot back what, we, what they think we want to hear. I think moral literacy is a small piece of the challenge. I think the much bigger piece of the challenge is how do you develop a moral identity in a child? How do you make these values integral to who a person is, a part of the self. How do you make children want to become good people in the world? How do you place morality at the center of their motivation? How do you make morality part of kids' reflexes and dis dispositions? For the Dutch who rescued the Jews in World War II, they didn't describe it as a choice. They described it as something that was natural, as natural to them as breathing. It was in the water. It was who they are. And I think this is the question that we have to ask ourselves. Have we really made morality a priority? Have we made morality such a priority that kids are willing 
to choose to do something that's in someone else's interest or in the community's interest and not at their interest in pivotal moments? Are they willing to sometimes sacrifice an achievement for someone else? Um, and my concern is that in many instances they're not because of the degree to which we have not made this moral, having a moral identity a priority. A second capacity that I think that we tend to neglect that's very important to um, develop in kids is moral awareness. So we're having this conversation about empathy in the country and there's a lot of programs out there that are trying to develop empathy. And usually the way we talk about empathy is we talk about kids either having it or not having it or having a lot of it or a little of it. But the much bigger issue is who do they have empathy for? Almost all kids have empathy. They may have empathy for their friends, they may have empathy for their families, for their religious groups. The issue is that they often don't have empathy for people who are different from them or people who are less fortunate than them. They often don't treat as visible and real the waitress or the bus driver or the custodian or the school secretary. These folks slip off their radar. They are invisible to them. Harvard students, and they're often nice, lovely students, leave their crap all over the cafeteria and all over the halls, and they're not thinking that somebody has to pick this stuff up. It's not on their radar. It's not in their moral awareness. And I think much of our challenge with kids is putting people in their moral awareness who are not in their circle of concern. How do we continually expand our kids' circle of concern? And I think it's when our kids are able to appreciate multiple perspectives, including the perspective of kids who are different from them, that they have the foundation for understanding what justice really means. Let me mention one other moral capacity, and then I'm going to go through the other ones briefly. And that's the emotions and managing difficult feelings. Another problem with just talking about these values is that when you think about times that you've transgressed, when you violated um, your, your own standards, it's not because you didn't know the standard or you didn't know what was right from wrong. It's almost always because of some emotion. Envy, shame, anger, frustration, greed, lust, pride. These are the emotions that are the engines of moral development. These are what can cause us to violate our principles. I play men's basketball still in sort of a laboratory for understanding moral regression. And, you know, sometimes we act like baboons on the basketball court. And that's, it's not because we don't understand right from wrong. It's because we're in an environment that is causing us to regress in these ways, that there are emotions that are driving this. And I want to just mention two motions that I think are especially important to moral development. One of them is shame. And I mention shame because there's quite a lot of research that shame is at the root of cheating, at delinquency. James Gilligan has written a book about shame being the root of violence, um, of disrespect of many different kinds. And I want to just ask, does anyone want to venture to a thought about the difference between shame and guilt? Go for it. That was quick. This is great. Any, any other thoughts about it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so guilt usually is, when, is a deed. It's when we violate one of our own inner standards. And one of the things about guilt, in a way one of the good things about guilt, is guilt often insists on and reveals a path to repair itself. So you do something wrong, you violate one of your standards, and usually you have some idea about how you can fix the situation. You can apologize, you can make amends of some kind. Shame is about the exposure of defects in the self, and especially about the public exposure of defects in the self. And shame collects and festers in the self. There isn't a path often or a way of releasing shame. And if I were to ask you, I'm not gonna do it, but about your painful memories of childhood, my guess is that you would remember a, a case of shame because of the way humiliation and shame can sit and fester in the self. So I really worry about shame, and I worry about two things. I worry about parents who won't punish their kids because they're worried that their kids are going to feel some shame. 
Shame and guilt are very important emotions. We don't want kids to not feel shame or not feel guilt. Shame and guilt are the basis of conscience. They're what bind us as a society. But I also worry about too much shame. And I worry that, you know, 30 years ago, and there's good research to support this, that in many communities, we didn't, oh, we used to overtly shame kids. So 30 years ago, we used to say, you're not as polite as the kid down the block or as bright as the kid down the block. Or in some way, you're imperfect relative to other kids, very overtly. We don't tend to do that kind of overt shaming. At least in many communities, we don't do that kind of overt shaming. But there are all kinds of hidden ways that we can shame our kids. You know, one way is if we make the metrics of success very narrow. And I think in many communities, the metrics of success are whether you achieve a lot, whether you're happy, whether you're popular. And there are a lot of kids who aren't going to be popular. There are a lot of kids who aren't going to achieve a lot. There are a lot of kids who aren't going to be happy for periods of time. And I think we got to think hard about elevating other metrics of success, that you're successful if you're feisty and soulful and funny and a good friend and kind and responsible. I mean, we got to get away from just these very narrow measures of what it means to be a successful person. I also just want to say that I think that when kids feel shame, it's often connected to our own shame or something that we haven't worked out. And it's often a time that really should prompt us to be self-observing and to reflect. Let me just tell you, mention really briefly a few other moral capacities that I think of as very important. And then I want to talk some about uh, the, re the research we've been doing. So um, another moral capacity, you know, how many of you have heard of Lawrence Kohlberg? Anybody? Carol Gilligan? More people have heard of Carol. So Carol Gilligan and Lawrence Kohlberg were also very concerned about this focus on values and teaching kids values. And their point was that almost all moral dilemmas or almost all moral conflicts are situations where values conflict. So when you think about moral dilemmas in your life, or you, you know, a common dilemma that I hear from high school students is somebody stole, a friend of mine stole a calculator, an iPod from another kid, and the teacher asked me who stole the iPod or the calculator. Should I be honest with the teacher or should I be loyal to my friend? I don't know if some, you know, any of you have followed in Boston, we really follow the Whitey Bulger situation. And there was, this, there was a poll in Boston several years ago. It was Billy Bulger was a state congressman, the president of UMass, Whitey's brother. And there was a poll about whether or not Whitey, Billy should, should tell the, talk to the FBI about where Whitey is. And about half of Bostonians thought this was a loyalty issue. You don't rat out your brother. And about half of Bostonians thought this was a justice issue. Of course you have to tell about your brother. He's a horrible human being, and he's, and he's killing people. So here loyalty and justice collide. And Kohlberg and Gilligan's point was you have to teach kids how to morally reason. And this is something we can come back to in our discussion if you are interested. Um, let me just mention a couple of things very quickly. Some of you may know there's an SEL movement going on in the country, social emotional learning. I am talking here about social emotional learning skills, helping kids develop perspective taking, self-awareness, self-regulation, the ability to make good decisions, but also more minute, fine-grained important things. Helping kids know how to praise someone else. Helping kids know how to criticize someone else. How to help someone else without patronizing them. And some kids do these things very normally and very naturally. Other kids need guidance in how to do those things. Sometimes I think we're not giving them that guidance. Finally, the strength and maturity of the self. And I'm going to come back to this one. But if we really want kids to be courageous and to stand up for principles and to sacrifice, it's very much about developing the self. Not self-esteem, but de developing the maturity and sturdiness of the self. And again, I will come back to this one. Let me tell you about our research, and it's very relevant to what I've been talking about. We did research in five high schools. Um, one of those was Cambridge Ridge and Latin High School, which is a, a wonderfully diverse high school where my kids went. It's uh, 76 different languages are spoken, 60 different countries or 50 different countries are represented. It's very economically diverse as well. One was a high school in Boston with a very high percentage of low-income kids. Another was an independent school out of Boston with a outside of Boston with a very high 
percentage of affluent kids in two schools in the South, one a working class school and one a rural working class low income school. And then we've subsequently done research in 10 additional schools. So we have significant economic and racial and ethnic diversity in our sample. Not comprehensive by any means, but significant diversity in our sample. And we ask kids about a lot of things. We ask them about race and class differences and the way they think about, uh, the way they think about morality. But I want to just mention one aspect of the research and one finding, set of findings that I found especially striking and especially troubling. We asked high school students this simple question. What's most important to you? Being a happy person, being a good person who cares about others, achieving at a high level, or having a high status career? We also asked them to imagine how their parents would rank those things for them. So is it more important to your parents that you're happy, that you're a good person, that you achieve at a high level, that you have a high status career? And we asked them, you know, people mean very different things by happiness, goodness, achievement. What do you mean by happiness? How do you define it? What do you mean by goodness? What do you mean by achievement? And what do you see as the relationship between those things? What we found is that most kids said their happiness was more important to them than there being good people who care about others. And an even higher percentage of kids said that their parents would rank their happiness as more important, almost two-thirds than that they're being good people who care about others. And I want you to pause and to think about that for a minute because the child historians tell me that this is unlike any previous generation in this country. That schools were founded to build moral character in kids and parents' primary responsibility was to build moral character in kids. And how they would define moral character might be very different from how you or I would define it, but it was clear that moral character was the priority. Often it was kids being obedient or kids being respectful, but it was moral character. But I, want to, I don't want to cartoon parents or kids here because one of the things, students here, because one of the things we also heard is that students really cared about being good people as well. And what was interesting is in many ways how they thought about the relationship between happiness and goodness. Because what we heard from many high school students was, first I have to be happy or have self-esteem and then I can be a good person. It's like if I feel good and I feel good about myself, then I can give to other people. It's sort of like the oxygen mask on the airplane. I have to fill myself up first and then I can help out my neighbor. And this dovetails with the self-esteem movement, which has been telling us in talk shows, in, in parent advice books, for 25 years that if you have high self-esteem, you're going to be more virtuous. You're going to have more to give to other people. And again, I want you to pause and think about what an unusual idea this is. But the Bible and Western literature told us for centuries is not that happiness was the foundation for morality, but that suffering was the foundation for morality. <laughs> that being able to sacrifice, to take on the burdens of other people, to empathize with people that were suffering was the foundation for morality. That many parents today are conveying to their kids that self-esteem or happiness is the foundation for morality might be unprecedented in the history of humankind. And I don't think this is a crazy idea. You know, I think when kids have self-esteem, I think they often can stand up for themselves more effectively. I think they can feel more generous, more expansive. But I don't think of self-esteem as a foundation for morality. I think these things are a foundation for morality. Having a deep moral identity, having moral awareness, being able to morally reason, being able to manage difficult feelings. And there's another side of this, which, you know, contentment can infamously breed indifference. Sports fans don't riot when their team wins the, loses the championship game. Sports fans riot when their team wins the championship game. Narcissists, bullies, delinquents, the research shows, according to almost all the self-esteem measures, don't have low self-esteem, they have high self-esteem. They can feel very powerful. High school athletes who abuse their girlfriends can feel very powerful, and in that sense, they have a lot of social status. And in that sense, 
they can feel high self-esteem. And I think the kicker in all this, the irony, is that all this attention to our kids being happy isn't even making them happier. <laughs> I think it's probably making them less happy. The allergy that a lot of parents have to their kids experiencing adversity of any kind, you know, the degree to which parents are swooping in to help kids deal with peer conflicts of different kinds, I think, or maneuvering to get their kids on winning teams, I think these kind of things can deprive kids of the coping strategies that are, in fact, super important for their long-term well-being. One of the things that I see around Cambridge, I'm not sure this is going on now, but um, around here, but I also see just a lot of attention to kids' moment-to-moment -moment feelings um, in certain communities. So one of the things, you know, I'll be at the playground and I'll see parents noting their kids' moods every 10 minutes. It's like, that must make you frustrating, that must make you sad, that must make you angry. <laughs> It's like the mood police are out. And, and it's, you know, it's like pulling up a bandage every 10 minutes to see if a wound is healing. And you know, I am all for parents helping kids identify and articulate their feelings. I think it's especially important to get boys to identify and articulate their feelings. But I'm worried about the frequency with which we're doing this, or some of us are doing this. And I think I used to do this with my own kids. I worry it makes kids hyper-attentive to their own feelings. It causes kids to dramatize their own feelings, to make their inner lives theater. And that we could do much better to spend at least equal amount of time thinking about how other kids are feeling on the playground and getting our kids to tune in to how other kids are feeling. And in a big way, I guess my main point here is I, you know, I think we have it backwards. I don't think it's happiness or self-esteem that leads to goodness or caring. I think it's goodness and caring that's far more likely to lead to happiness and self-esteem. And that's true because if we're able to tune into other people and care for other people and appreciate and take responsibility for other people, we're going to have better relationships our whole lives. We're going to be better spouses. We're going to be better parents. We're going to be better friends. We're going to be better mentors. And those relationships are the most durable, most robust source of well-being that we have. And good research supports that. I want to qualify this, though, in one way. While I do think that if our kids are able to care and, and tune into other people, they're likely to be happy, or it's a strong source of happiness, I don't think we should tell kids to be good because it will make them happy. And I emphasize that because I think that's something that I used to do when my kids were younger, that I see other parents doing. I say, be nice to somebody because then they'll be nice to you. Or pass the ball because then they'll pass the ball back to you. And I think there are two things that are wrong with this. You know, one is that certain kinds of morality, by definition, don't make you happy. You know, sacrificing for an important principle, sacrificing for a friend may not make you happy. Taking care of a chronic Somebody who's chronically ill may, not, may not, not make you happy. Going to a faculty meeting doesn't make me happy. <laughs> um, but I'm only half kidding because I am, you know, these are things that I do because it's important to be a citizen of a community. And I don't know that we're enabling our kids in the way that we could to be citizens of community who really exercise their ethical obligations even when it doesn't make them happy. The second thing I'm concerned about is it still makes happiness the goal. It's like we're telling kids to be good because it'll make you happy. It doesn't make morality the goal. And I, I'm concerned that we've lost this sense of morality for its own sake. That we don't tell kids to do what's right because it's right, to do what's moral because it's moral, to do what's good because it's so important for our collective good. Let me just mention a few more concrete ways that I think we can begin to shift this balance back some from this intense focus on happiness achievement toward morality. So one of them is, is fairly simple. It's straightforward. It's rather than telling our children the most important thing is their happiness, what if we said to them the most important thing is that you're kind? Henry James said, Three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind, the second is to be kind, and the third is to be kind. 
The second is to be aware of the subtle ways in which we might be prioritizing our kids' happiness over their concern for other people. So I think with my kids, sometimes I would let them write off other kids they found annoying or not reach out to a friendless kid in the playground or not write thank you notes or not be respectful to my friends. And all these ways I was privileging their happiness over their concern for other people. I was interviewing uh, a while ago a couple um, and their who were debating with their daughter whether she should quit the soccer team. And she was a very good soccer player, but she wasn't having any fun. And the mother said, let her quit. She's not having any fun. And the dad said, but she's a very good soccer player, and it's going to be important for her college resume. And I thought to myself, neither of them said anything about her having an obligation to the team. And about six months later, I was talking to my wife. And my daughter, who was a dancer in high school, wanted to quit her dance group. And I said to my wife, let her quit. She's not having any fun anymore. And my wife said, excuse me, Mr. Moral Development. <laughs> we can't just let you know, her quit the group. She has an obligation to this group. And I'm concerned that we don't any longer or not enough tell our kids that their classrooms are communities to which they have obligations, their schools are communities to which they have obligations, their neighborhoods, their religions, that there are these entities, these, these principles and groups of people bigger than themselves to whom they have obligations. It's a very important thing to do. And the final thing I wanted to suggest to you is that rather than making self-esteem the focus, what if we made maturity the focus? And this is related to social emotional learning. But if you think about the maturity as the ability to balance and coordinate our needs with others, to take a third person perspective, to be able to lift ourselves out of a relationship and look, out, look inside it and see the dynamics inside it, important to do in our romantic relationships too, to be res reflective and self-critical, to, to get feedback and actually be able to change based on that feedback, to manage these destructive feelings. I think these are the capacities that are so critical for productivity at work. These are the ca capacities that are critical for healthy, respectful, mutual relationships. And these are the qualities that I think are key bases for moral functioning, for ethical functioning. I want to talk about a trend that I think of as very connected to this focus on happiness. And that's the blizzard of praising that's going on, the degree to which we are praising our kids. And I'm talking about a couple of different kinds of praise. I'm talking about um, global praise, telling kids they're wonderful and special all the time, <clears throat> but also just excessive praise, just praising kids a lot. And I thought about this when I was at the park several years ago, and I was watching a father and son play catch. And I noticed that every time this kid caught the ball or threw the ball, the father complimented it. And when the father dropped the ball, the kid, the, when the kid dropped the ball, the father said, nice try. So every act in this game of catch got a compliment of one kind or another. And there are sports programs, very popular, that are telling parents that they should praise their kids five times for every single time they criticize them after every game, and they should tell their kids they're proud of them before and after every game. And, you know, I got this stuff in my head for a period of time, and I remember I was with my son, who was probably 15 at the time, I was taking him to a basketball game, and I just said, David, I just want you to know that I'm really proud of you. And he said, what's the matter with you, Dad? <laughs> And I, you know, I think what he was saying to me is, I haven't done anything. I mean, what, why now are you telling me that you praise me, that, that you're proud of me? Um, why do you feel the need to prop me up? And this is a point that William Damon makes at, you know, at Stanford, that a lot of kids, you know, kids can distinguish between when they've really done something that's praiseworthy and when they haven't. And when we praise them and it's unearned, they can feel patronized by it. Like, why, am, why is my parent feeling the need to praise me now when I haven't really accomplished anything? When we're praising kids all the time, we're also judging them all the time. It may be positive, but it's an assessment. This is not a relaxed game of catch between a father and son. This is a constant performance that's getting assessed all the time. And Carol Dweck writes about this, and I'm delighted that Carol Dweck's going to be coming to 
um, ETHS because Carol Dweck, I think, has been really a guru about this issue of praise. And this is one of the things that she's concerned about. I also think that this idea of praise is based on a false notion of the self and how the self matures and grows. That we think of the self as like a tank and that the more we praise it, the more we fill up the tank. But the self doesn't grow by being praised. It grows by being known. It grows when we're really able to spend the time to know who our kids are and to appreciate who our kids are, to value who they are very specifically and uniquely, not through the amount of times that we praise them. So I'm not against praising. I just want to offer some guidelines for what I think of as healthy and unhealthy praise. Um, I certainly think we should tell our kids occasionally they're terrific and that they're wonderful, but it should be based on some accumulated sense that they are terrific and wonderful. One of the things that Carol Dweck says, which I think is absolutely right, is that we should be specific about praise. And she has good data to support this. So in this game of catch between the father and son, really helpful and appropriate to say something about the follow through on the throw, for example, instead of the global praise. In a painting, something about the way a limb on a tree was painted, rather than just that's wonderful. Giving kids specific information gives them feedback that in fact energizes them for additional compliment in a way that Dweck's research shows that global praise can deflate additional motivation and energy. I, you know, I also think that we have to be child and context specific, that there are some kids who soak up praise or other kids who are patronized very quickly by small amounts of praise. So you know, this is an area where it's like all areas where it's really important to know your child. And finally, I just want to say that I think it's important to ask, why are we praising so much? And why at this time in history are we praising so much? And I think part of it is that when people are super busy, um, they start praising their kids. You know, one of the things I started to notice with my daughter is that when I was traveling a lot and I was away, I would come home and start telling her how terrific she was as if somehow the praise could substitute for my time. This is something that teachers will say to me too, particularly if they're in classrooms where they have 25 or 30 kids that they use, sometimes they find themselves praising because they don't really have the time to attend to kids in the ways they want. I think sometimes in praising we are projecting too. It's really us that need the reassurance as parents. It's not really about our kids. So it's important to think about, you know, when you find yourself praising a lot, and I'm really trying to be vigilant about this, about why it is that we are praising as much as we are. I want to clarify that I'm talking here about trends. I am not talking about individuals. And there are huge race, class, and culture differences in what I'm describing. So, when I say that I worry about kids being too self-focused, I worry about some kids being too other-focused or too organized around other people. I worry especially about girls who I think can be too other-focused or too organized around other people. And I think the challenge for them is much more around self-assertion. It's not around being more organized around other people. Um, I also think it's really important to think about some of these economic differences, culture differences, race differences. In low-end communities, you don't tend to see parents overpraising their kids. You don't tend to see this heavy focus on self-esteem. You do tend to see much more of a focus on the collective. In African-American communities, there's been a long tradition of prioritizing or thinking about the collective, not just about your individual well-being. In many immigrant communities, there's also much more attention to the collective. And I wanted to say one thing about a trend among immigrant families when they come to this country that I think partly illustrates this point. And that's that when immigrant kids first come to this country, they tend to be doing better than their non-immigrant American counterparts on almost every emotional and moral measure. They're less likely to abuse drugs, less likely to be depressed, less likely to be an an anxious, less likely to be delinquent. A lot of adults report that they're very respectful the longer they're here, the worse they're doing on all these measures. And by the third generation, they tend to do as bad or worse than their non. This is across a whole wide array of immigrant groups, all the major immigrant groups. They're doing as bad or worse. And there's a notion out there on the airwaves 
that immigrant families are a threat to America's moral culture. And what the data seem to be suggesting <laughs> is that it's America's moral culture that is a threat to immigrant kids. And you know, this is a puzzle with many pieces, but I think one piece of it is that in many immigrant communities, many communities of color, there is a high priority placed on moral character. There is a high priority placed on the collective. There isn't this intense focus on individual well-being and achievement. I want to turn to um, another trend that I think of as very tied up with this focus on our kids' happiness and, another, and something else that's a new phenomena in American parenting, and that's the degree to which we are seeking closeness with our kids. And this is a giant social experiment, and in many ways, I think it's a wonderful social experiment that parents want to be closer to their kids. They want to reveal more about their own lives with their kids. They don't want to be so remote, especially dads. They want their kids to reveal more about their lives. They want to have more relaxed, fun time with their kids. But I also am concerned about it. And my concerns got stirred up on a plane ride uh, several years ago. And I was talking to a dad, and I was having a conversation that I find that I've had frequently with dads who are my age and younger, and it's and a little younger. And it's a conversation about our relationships with our own dads and how they differ from our relationships with our kids. And I love my dad very much, and I had a close relationship with my dad, but I'm much closer to my own kids in a lot of ways, and I think that we do share more with each other. And I mean, in some ways, we are, we are considerably closer. And this guy said to me, I know exactly what you mean. I get stoned with my kids all the time and their friends. <laughs> it's like we're all equals. We can all play together. And I thought to myself, that's not exactly what I meant. But this is going to be a long plane flight. Um, but this is where I think it gets blurred and where it gets muddy in people's mind. There is a big difference between being very close to your kids and being your kid's best friend. And these are hard lines to parse, but they are bright lines that are important to be able to keep um, in our relationships with our kids. And I worry about this idea of best friends or, or your kids being your equals for a number of reasons. One is I think kids need to idealize you. And I think we can undermine that process of idealization. That's one way, one pathway, by which they internalize our moral values. If for a period of time, they idealize us and want to become like us. And I think we can dilute their incentive to become like us when we treat them as equals. A bigger problem in my mind is the degree of trouble that many parents are having disciplining their kids, holding their kids to high ethical standards, because they can't tolerate their kid's anger, and they can't tolerate a fracture in the relationship. And um, I think when you're relying on your kids for closeness, it becomes much harder to be able to tolerate anger. This is something I've struggled with. It becomes much to harder to tolerate any brief fracture in the relationship. The third thing that I worry about is that kids need to separate with us, especially in adolescence they need to separate. Um, from us. And this is you know, something I struggled with with my son for a period of time. And I remember hearing a psychologist on the radio talking about parents having letting go disorder. And I knew what he meant. That, you know, I think we do have a hard time when we're very close to our kids, letting them separate in appropriate ways at different developmental periods. And that our appreciating them as separate and distinct is so important for their capacity to appreciate other people as separate and distinct from them. It's our appreciation of their separateness, in part, that helps the self mature and grow. So there are a few things I just want to suggest about this. One is that I do think that it's really important to draw this bright line between being our kids' parents and being our kids' friends. And when push comes to shove, the bottom line is we have to be the parent and not the close friend. I also think this is a hard thing for me. It's been, it was a hard thing for me and maybe a hard thing for you, for other parents, to disentangle sometimes what about the closeness is about their needs and what is about your needs. And my wife has been helpful with this. My close friends have been helpful with this. Times where I feel like I want to spend time with my son, I feel like I'm maybe pushing him. Am I doing this for him? Am I doing it for me? But there are many situations like this where I think we sometimes need 
to talk to people we really respect and trust to get their perspective about this. And the third thing I want to say about it is that one trend we're seeing in the country is that adults are having fewer, have fewer friendships. And one of the things that has meant parents particularly are having fewer friendships. We're spending more time watching TV and we're spending more time with our kids. That parents are relying on kids for closeness that in other times they would have relied on, for, on other adults for. And I think the simple message here is it's really important to maintain some close friendships if you can. Um, and not really look to your kids for those kinds of closeness. So let me just talk about one more threat that I think will be very familiar to you, to our kids' moral development. And then I really would like to open this up for your questions and thoughts and for discussion. And that's achievement pressure. And from my perspective, uh, an intense amount and too intense amount of achievement pressure in some communities. One of the things that you see from the research is that there are two populations in this country that are suffering the risk factors at the, higher, the highest rates. And by the risk factors, I mean depression, anxiety, substance abuse, delinquency. Low-income kids who are dealing with a lot of, often, very serious ongoing stresses day to day, and high-income kids. It's affluent kids and low-income kids that are suffering the highest rates of these risks. The causes are different in low-income communities, and the consequences are different in low-income communities than they are in high-income communities. But these are the two populations that we should be most concerned about. Affluent girls are suffering depression at two to three times higher a rate than girls, teenage girls, in the general population. And there's good research. This is also Sunaya Luthar's research at Columbia that shows that at least one piece in this puzzle is the amount of achievement pressure that kids are experiencing. And I think part of the problem is that in some communities, achievement has become the primary goal of child raising. And in our survey in an affluent community, 45% of kids said it was more important to their parents that they achieve at a high level and get into a good college that they were, than that they were good people who cared about others. And that by itself is sobering. I think there are also parents who are just outright unethical and pretty outrageous about achievement pressure. And I don't think it's a, it's a big group of parents. I think it's a small group of parents, but I think it can affect the parent population generally. And I'm talking here about parents who get their kids falsely diagnosed as having ADDs, so they'll have more time on the SAT, or parents who threaten to sue guidance counselors who don't write good college recommendations for their kids, or parents who are getting SAT, getting college counselors that cost $30,000 for their kids beginning junior year in high school. I mean, some things that parents are doing without any sense of equity or fairness, from my perspective. And again, it's not most parents, it's a small fraction of parents. But it's, it's real. And I think these parents are also ramping up a community service Olympics that's going on in many high schools. Who can get the most high-profile community service opportunity? I had a girl said to me in a high-powered independent school around Boston recently, I can't just work, give flowers to the elderly or work in a nursing home or be a volunteer in a soup kitchen. I have to cure AIDS in Africa if I'm going to get into college for my community service. And there are, parents, there are two parents at the school who told me, me that they had started a school for their daughter in Botswana. So she could say for her community service she started a school in Botswana. And this set up a mini competition, so a couple other parents got their kid an AIDS clinic in Guam. So he could say that he had started <coughs> this AIDS clinic in Guam. And um, what I'm, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but what I worry about is that it creates a contagious effect, that people start to feel like they're cheating their own kid if they, if they aren't doing these things. Or you start to feel as a kid that if you aren't doing something high profile like this, you're not going to get into the college that you want to get to. I think there's another problem going on here which is much more pervasive though and it's much more subtle. And that's the number of parents who are sending hypocritical messages and contradictory messages to their kids about status and achievement. And 
I started becoming aware of this talking to high school students who would just point out to me that their parents would say to them, it doesn't matter whether you go to a high, high status college, I just want you to go to college that really fits for you, that really works for you, but then pay jaw-dropping amounts of money for an SAT tutor beginning in the seventh grade, or send them to a high school where the culture of achievement was so fierce that they couldn't possibly resist that kind of ach achievement pressure or it'd be hard to resist that kind of achievement pressure. Some parents, I think, are sending messages to kids that are intended to take the pressure off some, but can't possibly be taking the pressure off. I interviewed one parent who said, without a trace of irony, that while it was very important to her that her children go to great colleges, her husband felt differently, he would be happy if they went to Swarthmore. Other kids we talked to were very aware of another kind of gap or another kind of hypocrisy. Um, they talked about how their parents said, I want you to go to a high status college so you'll have choices. You'll be able to be a doctor or a corporate leader or a lawyer. And some of the kids that we talked to said, um, you know, when they send me to schools like this where the culture of achievement pressure is so fierce, are they really giving me the choice to be a whole other set of things? Could I go into forestry or carpentry or become an electrician or become a florist or become a teacher? And are they, in these cultures, expanding my choices by going to these colleges or are they narrowing my choices in a sense? So hearing these stories, I decided that I really needed to clarify with my own son how I felt about this. He was a junior in high school at the time, and we went out for a walk one night. It was one of those nice, father, lovely father-son moments where I was going to pass on my wisdom to him. And, and I said to him, you know, I, um, I just want you to know that as far as your mom and I are concerned, we, want, we don't want status to be a factor in this college decision. We want you to go to a place that you really think is going to be the right place for you. And he said it in a pretty nice way, but he basically said, Dad, that is the biggest crock of crap that I have ever heard. <laughs> you teach at Harvard. My, my cousins have all gone to high-status schools. We live in a community where status and going to high-status schools is important. He was sort of saying to me, you can take the high road on this. You can take the high ground because you know there are all these other forces that are doing the muscling for you. You know, this is just so in the water. And, you know, I was a little ticked off. And this was like our father-son moment. And he wasn't really appreciating my wisdom. But I, th but I think he was entirely right. You know, and it was, a very, it, was a, it was a sobering moment for me that I really hadn't done the work about thinking about the kind of messages that I had sent to him and the mixed messages that I was sending to him about this and that this community was sending to him. And I had work to do. I, my, you know, I don't want to bash parents here. I think these are very complex issues, but I think they're very serious issues. And they're serious issues because of the rates of depression and anxiety and delinquency and substance abuse that kids are experiencing. And it is a kind of epidemic of, of a kind. And I have a few recommendations, and I know people have very different values about high achievement and very different ways of thinking about high achievement. But there are certain forms of extreme pressure that I just think are reckless and irresponsible. And I think they're kind of red flags for all of us about this. You know, if our self-esteem plummets when our kid doesn't get into a high-status college, that should be a red flag. If we're popping vocabulary cards at the dinner table every night, that should be a red flag. If we're on family vacations and it's consumed by preparation for college, that should be a red flag. If we're going on college visits with our kids and we find ourselves asking all the questions, that should probably be a red flag too. When our kids aren't eating well or sleeping well, in our surveys we find that about 20% of kids say they're not sleeping well in affluent communities because they're worried about achieving enough or achieving a high enough level. They're stressed about grades. You know, if our kids aren't eating or sleeping well, that should be a red flag. Wendy Mogul says that we should adhere to the 20-minute rule. Never spend more than 20 minutes a day thinking about our kids' achievement. 
that may be a high bar, but it seems like a great bar to me, like a really important bar to try and reach for. You know, we should ask ourselves, is it more important? Are we happier when we hear that our kids get all A's? Or are we happier when we hear from our teachers that our kid is really kind and contributes to the classroom? Are we happier when our kid gets the best athlete award or gets the sportsmanship award? Does the sportsmanship award seem like a chump award to us, like it often does to other kids? Or do we really recognize it for what it is? Um, I also just think that we have to put achievement in some context for kids. We have to make it meaningful. You know, about 25, 20% of Harvard students at some point in their Harvard career will be medicated for anxiety or depression. And this often is connected to their stress about achieving. And I was talking to the guy who used to be the head of the Bureau of Study Council at Harvard, and I was saying to him, what do you think's going on here? And he said, I know it might seem cliche, but I think a lot of the problem is that a lot of these kids don't have a passion, and a lot of the work we're doing is trying to help them discover a passion. They have just been achieving to achieve, or they've been achieving to please their parents. This is what Alice Miller wrote about in the drama of a gifted child 20 years ago, that this often is about parents' needs. It's not about who kids really are and what kids really want. And he said, you know, you find that when you get kids to find some meaning for their achievement, it can be a larger social purpose, it can be an artistic framework, but that a lot of the angst, a lot of the pain around achieving at school disappears. It becomes something they want to do, that they're internally motivated to do. I also think it's very important for us to separate the very rational reasons why we want our kids to achieve from the irrational reasons. Is this about our status concerns? Is this about our competitive feelings with other parents? Is it, as Alyssa Quart says, a terror that our kids will be ordinary, that our kids won't be special in some way? And I just want to say that, you know, I, I don't mean to make it sound like I've totally worked this out, but I've worked it out some, and I have far better conversations with my younger kids than I had with my oldest son about this, because I'm really able to be candid with them about the ways in which there is hypocrisy about this, the ways in which power and status and recognition from my experience, what I know, what these things can bring to your life, but what these things don't bring to your life as well. The ways in which achievement was handled in my own family of origin and how I do and do not want to reproduce that in my family, in our family, in my family with them. And let me just say finally that I, I think we are in the grip of a kind of public health problem here. I don't think I'm being hyperbolic about this. And I say that because of the rates of depression and anxiety, but also because I think this functions as a contagion. So if, you're getting an, if your neighbor's getting an SAT tutor in the ninth grade, you feel like you're cheating your kid if you don't get an SAT tutor in the ninth grade. If your neighbor is getting a college, hiring a college counselor, you feel like you're, you're cheating your kid by not hiring a college counselor. I think parents start to ratchet each other up and schools start to ratchet each other up in this regard as well. That it is spiraling upward in a way that's really destructive and that we really need to think about. And like any contagion, I think it needs individuals who are willing to be courageous, parents who are willing to be courageous and say, this is getting crazy, I'm not going to buy into it anymore, and teachers, educators who are also willing to really stand up to parents and stand up um, and, and be true to what the reason they came in the profession. But I also think it's a problem that probably needs to be collectively addressed in some way. There's a guy in Minnesota named Bill Doherty who I really admire who has done something around birthday parties. And basically what he has said is, you know, parents were pay paying ridiculous amounts of money on their kids' birthday parties. And he created this compact where he said to parents, sign this compact that you won't spend more than $40 on your kids' birthday parties. And this thing caught on like wildfire in Minnesota. And you know, I think parents probably felt relieved, you know, like they, did, they could get out of the competition and got them off the hook for being in this competition. And so, you know, I'm wondering, and this is, you know, I don't know the answer to this. I just feel like we have to answer it somehow. How are we going to solve this problem in affluent communities? And is it through a compact maybe that parents make with each other? It could start with something simple. You know, like let's not get SAT tutors for our kids before high school. I mean, just start there. Um, 
and I'm not suggesting this isn't going to be complicated. I think it is, but I think this is an important place to start. So let me just say, you know, in sum that um, and what I really want to leave you with is that um, there are a lot of great kids out there. and you know, There are a lot of us. Um, there are a lot of wonderful parents, but I do feel like we have an issue in our culture of not making the way we should caring responsibility for others a priority. That achievement and happiness have really become their, their, a priority. And this has big implications. It has implications for what we model for our kids day to day. Are we really modeling that our priority is caring and concern for other people? And it has big implications for the ways in which we raise our kids, the standards we hold them to, the expectations we hold with them to, how we interact with them in the minutiae day to day. Thank you very much. Thank you.